Well, hello and good, good morning, everyone. Um, happy Earth Day to all of you. My name is Mac Farnham, and I'm a public health veterinarian and veterinary epidemiologist with the Global Health Program at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. I currently serve there as the Morris Animal Foundation Dennis and Connie Keller Director of Training. And I'm really excited to, to be here with you folks today to talk about earth optimism and some of our um, training efforts and capacity building efforts around the globe. Um, is, and I'll just start off with a, with a short introductory blurb and, and then I'll go into some um, uh, uh, housekeeping housekeeping roles for the for the zoom meeting and and then we'll get to get to our the exciting part for me which is to talk with our panelists so to kick us off and set the set the background i want to talk about global grand challenges including species survival food insecurity diminishing natural resources and biodiversity climate change and emerging infectious diseases these are all super highly complex problem problems and challenges and we know that all of these challenges are driven in large part by an exponentially expanding global human population, human behaviors, and human activity. Such complex challenges like these require equally complex solutions. And science is really showing us it's key to collaborate across disciplines, cultures, countries, beliefs, and environments to make positive impacts on some of these challenges. One Health is the name that we put to this realization, namely that human, animal, and environmental health requires collaboration between human doctors, veterinarians, environmental and social sciences to understand the complex challenges and begin to find solutions. So my work with the Global Health Pro Program focuses on training wildlife veterinarians, One Health and conservation professionals to bridge scientific knowledge from the Smithsonian to these interfaces where wildlife domestic animals and humans are in increasing contact. This increased contact has some unfortunate side effects, including direct competition between species for, uh, for resources, fragmented habitats for migratory species, and directly contributes to emerging zoonotic diseases. And for those of you that don't know, zoonotic diseases are those that are shared between animals and humans. And usually we think of a zoonotic disease coming from a wildlife host or reservoir and spilling over into domestic animal populations or directly into humans where they may amplify and spread. We also know that humans can also transmit diseases to animals, which we've seen even in the recent pandemic with, uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 detections and some great apes and, and large cats in zoo, po zoo populations here in the US. We also know that some of these emerging diseases are best addressed as close to their sources as possible before they can emerge into human and domestic animal hosts. So to address some of these challenges to species survival, decreasing biodiversity and emerging disease threats, the global health pro our global health program has developed a comprehensive training program. Our, our training programs range from International exchanges, bringing, bringing wildlife and conservation professionals from overseas to the Smithsonian to, uh, to learn and exchange with us and vice versa, sending uh, some of our um, veterinary professionals and, and animal keepers to international locations around the world. Uh, we also do um, uh, species specific and disease specific train, training courses in some of the countries we work in. And then the real highlight for today is that uh, we focus a lot on internships and fellowships and postdoctoral opportunities uh, to provide training for, for some of the early to mid-career professionals in, in our overseas locations. And this effort, I do want to say, takes a lot of partnership and collaboration. And I really want to call out our, some of our supporters, including Morris Animal Foundation, who support my position. Uh, Impala Research Center in Kenya, Old Jogi Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya, the Elephant Transit Home in Sri Lanka, our colleagues with the Kenya Wildlife Service, and all the folks that have made the, uh, this, um, this event, Earth Optimism event, possible today. It's, it's a big group of people that I really want to want to thank. Um, so uh, just uh, bef before we get to go around and introduce all the panelists, um, I do want to just share some, some ground rules. We're, we really do want to keep this, uh, it, it, we may, purposely made it a Zoom meeting so we could get some, some questions from the audience and, and participation. 
Uh, so so the, the basic run of play is we'll do quick introductions for the panelists, and then I'll have, we'll go around the room and have them give each, uh, I posed a, a couple questions for each of them that they'll do about five minutes each, uh, talking about their background and their, and their work. And then, and then we'll go into a, a Q and A session. So if, if folks um, that are joining as audience, audience members, if you can keep uh, microphones muted, just so we don't get um, background noise, um, feel free to raise your hand in the, in the Zoom function or right into the chat function if you have a question and we're happy to unmute you and you can ask the question in person or you can feel free to, uh, to write it right there in the chat and we'll monitor that as we go through. Um, and I think with that, I just want to share again how, how excited I am to, to be with you, you here with all of you today. And I think this is going to be really exciting to hear from the, the panelists about some of the cool research and clinical work they're doing in wildlife conservation and in global health and why they're optimistic in the face of such complex uh, global health challenges. And with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to, to go around real quickly and um, have, have each of our panelists unmute and um, just say their name and their affiliation and their, their position and, and, and where they're currently located. And Sashi Kala, maybe I'll call on you first to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sashi Kala Gamage. I'm from uh, Sri Lanka and I'm a wildlife veterinarian working at Elephant Transit Home, Udavadava. So, my interest is uh, mainly focused on. Uh, Elephants and uh, pangolins. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sashi Kala. Catherine, would you like to go next, please? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Catherine Wesley Thomas. I'm a postdoctoral fellow, and uh, I'm originally from the UK, but I'm based in Kenya at the moment, and I'm working on uh, rabies and domestic dogs. Uh, and so I'm mostly really interested in zoonotic diseases. Um, and disease surveillance more generally. Great, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Janet, over to you. Uh, hello, I'm Janet Patterson Kane, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of the Morris Animal Foundation, and we're based in Denver, Colorado, uh, but we do fund wildlife research all over the world. Excellent, thank you, Janet. And over to you, Maureen. Hello everyone, I am Maureen Kamau and I'm a wildlife veterinarian and researcher uh, based in, at Mpala Research Center in Kenya. Um, I am currently a veterinary research fellow with the Smithsonian Institute's Global Health Program and I am working on a, a research project uh, doing passive disease surveillance in Laikipia, which involves sample collection from um, watering holes, which serve as disease hotspots in arid and semi-arid areas and collecting vectors such as mosquitoes and ticks from our environment uh, to get a better understanding of microbial diversity at the human wildlife livestock interface. Awesome. Thank you, Maureen. And Francesca. Hello, uh, my name is Francesca Vitali. I am a wildlife veterinarian from Italy, but I'm based in Kenya and I'm currently a postdoc fellow at Smithsonian Institution Global Health Program and I'm supported by Morris Animal Foundation. And my main research focuses on Eastern black rhinos health during capture and translocation. And I, in particular, I studied the stress on short and long term um, on long term and I uh, conduct my research in collaboration with the Kenya Wildlife Service, that is the authority for uh, uh, wildlife here in Kenya. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'll, just to lead us off, I'll, I'll go back around and, and have, have, uh, have folks tell us a bit more, a bit more in depth about their, their work and interests. Um, so, so Maureen, I'd like to come to you first and ask you to tell us a bit about your your recent research uh, tracking rhino reproduction, um, and reproductive status in, in female eastern black rhino, and, and give us a bit of 
found on that and why you undertook the research and what do you think some of the results, uh, how, how do you see the results being up, up applied towards rhino conservation? Uh, yeah, thanks, Max. So my recent research involved tracking 17 female eastern black rhinos at all Jogi Wildlife Conservancy in Laikipia to assess their progesterone profiles using non-invasive hormone analysis. The aim of the study was to investigate whether irregular estracyclicity and pregnancy losses are contributing to suboptimal reproductive performance in the Eastern Black Rhino population at Oljoki. Um, so we found that 10 rhinos were pregnant, four were cycling, and, um, and we couldn't determine the reproductive status of three because of sample collection challenges. But of interest, um, through non-invasive hormone analysis, we were able to diagnose pregnancy loss in one of the rhinos. Um, and stress activity during the wet and dry season and irregular cyclicity in some individuals. Um, but the major highlight of this study is it resulted in the establishment of Kenya's and the East African region's first wildlife dedicated endocrine lab. Um, and this work will not be possible without the assistance of rhino monitoring rangers at Oljogi and Oljogi's management who helped us with sample collection. Um, the Wildlife Endocrine Lab at the Smithsonian who provided training for me and other researchers in Kenya on hormone analysis techniques. And of course my global health uh, program mentors who guided me through the study. Um, so Mark, you asked why I undertook this research. Um, so the Eastern black rhino is critically endangered uh, with about 800 individuals in Kenya representing 84% of the um, in situ population in the world. Um, so Kenya has committed to increasing its meta population to 830 individuals by the end of this year and further increasing that population to um, 2,000 individuals to maintain um, genetic diversity and for long-term survival of this species. Um, but the growth rates of the Eastern black rhino subpopulations in the sanctuaries in Kenya have often fallen short of the 5% uh, per annum growth rate, highlighting the need to better understand the complex factors influencing reproductive performance. And this is because the, well, this is important because the future of Eastern black rhino conservation lies in ensuring optimal reproductive performance and securing su suitable habitat for population expansions, which necessitates rhino translocations to either uh, bolster um, already ex established uh, rhino subpopulations or act as founders for um, newly established sanctuaries. So homo hormone monitoring tools can be used to assess reproductive function of rhinos to guide decisions on individuals to translocate. Um, and hormone analysis can also be used in tandem with other um, variables such as um, ecological variables and demographic variables to guide decisions on um, rhino conservation management by understanding the rhino's physiological response to um, you know, the human induced say demographic factors. Um, yeah, and the other thing to mention is prior to the establishment of the of Kenya's and the East African region's past wildlife endocrine lab, researchers have had to overcome sample export bureauc bureaucracy while maintaining cold, um, cold storage until shipment to overseas labs for um, sample anas analysis of, of uh, samples collected from the field. So establishment of the endocrine lab provides um, an available resource for researchers and wildlife conservation managers as well, um, decreasing the time between 
um, sample analysis and you know decision making, which is critical for wildlife conservation management. Uh, it's fantastic. Thank you, Maureen, for that for that summary. That's perfect. Um, and next, I'll, I'll move over to uh, to Sashi Kala. Um, and can you get can you give us a, a bit of, of an overview of wildlife conservation in Sri Lanka and and some of the species you get to work with at Elephant Transit Home, in addition to elephant, obviously. And um, and I, I know that um, your current uh, research project is focused on and your interest is on pangolin and. I, I wondered if you could tell us how common pangolin are in Sri Lanka and what are some of the challenges facing pangolin and how are you working to address those? So over to you, Sashikala. Um, if I'm talking about the wildlife conservation status in Sri Lanka, uh, here we have a lot of uh, policies and uh, acts, regulations for make, make sure that the wildlife are Safe, safe, and uh, to conserve the conserve their uh, for the conservation of them. And um, here we have around uh, uh, 120, more than 120 species of uh, uh, mammals, mammal species. So more, around 30 to uh, 40 percent of them uh, were like endemic to Sri Lanka. So, and more than that, it's, uh, there are a lot of endangered species and even in, in um, animals as well as a lot of uh, endangered species of, uh, uh, of, of uh, animals and a lot of animals species. So, um, and in uh, elephant transit home, we have a veterinary hospital. So here we, get, uh, we receive a lot of injured animals and uh, mostly the birds, uh, birds and uh, different cat species and uh, uh, bears, sometimes bears and uh, elephants. Elephants are the main concern in elephant transit to um, mostly the elephant calf that we receive uh, often elephant calves and we manage them uh, until they are they are able to uh, reach uh, survive while survived in wild uh, survive in wild so um, yeah, pangolins are uh, uh, if I talk about the pangolins, pangolins are not that common in uh, common to see in uh, uh, humans because they are nocturnal animals and they are uh, we even they are uh, near nearby but we cannot see uh, in during daytimes. So uh, if uh, and uh, most of the the important of the pangolins is that uh, because they are survival survivability in captivity is uh, very low um, that's uh, the cases that we reach uh, reach reach to the hospital uh, are mostly um, caused by the human uh, intervention so uh, uh, so most of the time that when we receive the uh, receive pangolins, uh, they are stressed out and uh, they are uh, very uh, poor in their health condition. So it's really a challenge to challenge them, uh, challenge us, challenge them and challenge to us to uh, make their um, to provide them a better um, condition, better status to survive. And so, uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, the status. And I, uh, if I say, uh, I, I, um, if I say about the uh, summarizing the cases that I received uh, during last few, uh, months. 
most of the um, cases, around 90% of the um, pangolins that we received uh, are not survived. So uh, I was able to perform the postmortems and uh, doing some research about what are the reasons for their low survivability. So um, I, the most of the time they were came here with the uh, severely infected wounds. So um, they were. Uh, so and the other reason was uh, they had a uh, ectoparasitism, and most of the time we found severe endoparasitism as well. So those are the main reasons and the, um, we were able to found, find out that they have a severely uh, uh, pneumonic lungs at the time of death. Uh, so uh, those are the findings if I summarize the postmortems that, that we have done. Um, yeah, that's great. And, and let me just ask ask a follow up because I, I think that 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 most folks on on the call on on the Zoom will appreciate that one of the the biggest uh, challenges for for wildlife veterinarians working in in some of the the, the rescues and sanctuary centers um, is that yes, often oftentimes when the the wild animals come to us, they're they're not in optimal health, and it can be a real struggle to. Uh, to uh, get them back to health and 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 relocate them or rehome them and and get them back into a, a safe environment. So I, I wonder, Sashi Kala, if you could tell us, you know, where where did your interest in in working with with pangolin come from? Um, did, were you aware of them uh, um, for a long time, or is this is this something more recent interest of yours? Uh, yeah, the. The I first saw a pangolin in my final year, uh, in my final year. So, uh, and during my internship, I was able to work with work about pangolins. And uh, at uh, Pinnavada uh, Zoological Garden, so there also uh, I was a, I saw the most of the pangolins that. Uh, in the in that zoo also have low survivability so and they are like most they are like an innocent animal so and uh, uh, it's not common to see them so and uh, and uh, those things make me to the the problems i just identified that the survivability of them is like most challenging. So I just wanted to help them by doing something or increase their survivability in, the, in captivity. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And, and next I'll move over to, um, to uh, Janet. And um, I'm really super excited that you're here today uh, to and I'd, I'd like you to talk a bit about Morris Animal Foundation's support for more broadly for, for wildlife and exotic animals and, and, and your support for experiential training programs like, like we have with the, some of the panelists here online. And, and I'd, I'd really like you also to share a bit more uh, on your own personal background, where, where you come from and, and what some of your um, maybe uh, um, key wildlife species are that you, that you love. So. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, so I'm actually a veterinarian. Uh, I trained in my home country of New Zealand and did my PhD there. And uh, then I trained as a pathologist at the University of Florida, which has always had a big uh, zoo and wildlife program. Um, so when I went into my academic career in the United Kingdom and some of that time in Australia, uh, you know, there's not a lot of pathologists working in wildlife zoo pathology. There's not really a comfort zone there. So I was looking at everything from slugs to elephants um, for zoos, for wild release programs and for wildlife research. Uh, when I was in Australia and Queensland, I became pretty heavily involved in 
marine wildlife research, um, mostly with an input as a pathologist looking at animals that had died uh, and you know what the cause of death was. Um, did a lot of work. There's a big population of dugongs right beside the city there that have been followed for more than 20 years by a group of scientists and they're kind of like manatees but more hardcore. They're in the in the same family there and a lot of sea turtle work as well and it was a very sobering time for me because when people would say well why did this animal die a lot of these animals have multiple diseases and injuries and it's very hard to come up with an answer and the reason is that they're just uh, overwhelmed uh, and losing their resistance because of all these uh, effects in the environment both directly and indirectly from people so even when an animal is hit by a boat, it may also have underlying disease and you wonder if that made it more likely. So that was really one of the reasons why I started to get into what we would call the bigger picture of trying to find funding for scientific research. So the Morris Animal Foundation actually began in 1948. Uh, it's quite an old foundation for animal health funding. Uh, initially for companion animals, uh, but we funded our first wild animal study in 1967. Uh, we have an annual request for proposals, and this can be for established researchers or younger scientists looking for their first award, some smaller pilot grants, and also fellowships. So we have one of our fellows on the call today, which is really great to see. Um, our next round we're projecting will be in July for those of you who are interested. Uh, also in 2020, in response to the extreme wildfires in Australia, we set up the Australian Wildlife Fund of $1 million. That seems like a long time ago that that happened, uh, but it actually wasn't. Uh, and of course, Australia is one of those countries, we're all on the front line, but they're very much so and we're seeing some very severe uh, environmental change there. Uh, so we very quickly funded a round of studies. We were trying to find a, a gap there. One million dollars is really a drop in the ocean. Uh, but we did find that people were really lacking in clinical guidelines. So as these animals come into hospitals, into rehab, and then are released, there's really a lack of evidence there. So we've funded multiple projects there uh, that are underway at the moment. Um, we're currently looking at where we're spending the rest of, of, those, of that funding. Of course, we partner with the Smithsonian, so we're supporting Mac in his training program with a real emphasis on uh, the global nature of, of research. So we fund internationally. People from any country can uh, apply to us. We have some other exciting wildlife initiatives coming up this year, which unfortunately I can't really talk about, but you'll be hearing about those uh, too. Um, Mac also asked me to kind of talk about, you know, what can we do to support wildlife conservation? So on the scientific side of things, there's really a great need for funding for field research. We're really lacking the money to do these sorts of things. And it's not just observing, but how can we intervene? How can we save species? How can we help them adapt to what is already happening and is going to continue to happen in terms of environmental change? So we have all sorts of people involved with us at the foundation. Obviously, we like people to help us raise those funds, but we also have volunteers assisting with reviewing applications and so forth. You know, there's also some great citizen science programs out there for people to be involved in monitoring wildlife. Uh, and I guess it also say we can look at our own lives. So I'll be replacing all the non-native plants in my garden this spring. Uh, changing our own environment to encourage those native insects and birds and reptiles to come back. Back to you, Mac. Yeah, thanks, Janet. And, and I, can, I can really appreciate that. In my time in New Zealand, they were, they were really fighting with some of the um, non-native uh, plant species that had been introduced over time. So thanks for that. Okay, I, I think we'll go next over to Catherine, and um, I, I, I'm hoping you can tell us a bit about um, just the background on, on your work with, uh, with rabies in, in Kenya and, and maybe a, a global picture and, and why, we're, why we're still talking about um, rabies control and eradication, um, even though this is a, a fairly 
preventable disease. And um, I, I'd like you to give us a little bit of background on the, the Lycipia rabies vaccination campaign and the, the partnership there and how, how you found out about it and got interested and involved and, and transitioned that into your, your current postdoc. So over to you, Kat. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, working on uh, rabies in domestic dogs. And while uh, uh, canine rabies has been uh, well controlled in North America and a lot of Europe, it's very much endemic in many African countries and Asian countries, with Kenya being no exception of that. And actually, there's uh, been an estimated uh, 59,000 people that die each year from uh, rabies. And in Kenya, there's estimated to be about 2,000 each year. And uh, because of uh, the amount of uh, human mortalities caused by rabies alone, there's been an initiative that started in 2015, a global initiative to try and eradicate rabies by 2030. Uh, and so a lot of organizations from uh, diff uh, all different parts of the world have kind of come together to try to collaborate and develop different vaccination campaigns in uh, endemic regions. And so I'm working on a project that's focusing on the county of Lake Kipia in Kenya, which is in central Kenya, just north of Nairobi. And uh, the, uh, organize, the campaign started in 2015, like many others, uh, with the goal to try and eradicate rabies um, in the Lake Kipia area. And so we essentially, since 2018, there's been um, uh, kind of volunteer-based vaccination campaigns in different communities across Lake Kipia. Uh, and this is done uh, through two processes. One is um, point vaccinations where dog owners come to these specific areas and have their dogs vaccinated. So there's like publicity and things like that. And people come to those areas and have their dogs vaccinated for absolutely free. And there's other, the other mean is where uh, veterinarians will drive around in different communities and go to people's households and vaccinate their dogs. And the reason why um, doing uh, vaccination campaigns for free in uh, Lake Hipia is so important is because um, Lake Ipia has a lot of uh, remote areas, so uh, a lot of people don't have necessarily the possibility to go to a city and have their dogs vaccinated. And likewise, there's a lot of wildlife um, in Lake Ipia, and there's a lot of endangered wildlife, like the African wild dog, which is very susceptible to rabies. So it's really beneficial to try and have these campaigns in Lake Ipia because it's important for conservation, it's important for public health, and it's important for domestic animal health as well. And so this campaign in Lake Kipia has been going from uh, 2015 to two, uh, so from now, so about seven years. And uh, one key thing that's come out of this campaign is that uh, we're realizing that um, in order to eradicate rabies, you have to vaccinate about 70% of domestic dogs in a population. And what this campaign is showing is that in rural areas like areas in Lake Kipia, it can be quite hard to hit this 70% vaccination coverage because everybody being uh, scattered quite widely. And so uh, the goal of my project is to try and see if there's a way that we can have a more targeted approach to vaccination by targeting specific dogs that might be at higher risk of getting rabies. And so the way that we're doing that is by essentially doing household surveys. So we go to people's houses and we get information on the movement patterns of dogs and ownership practices to essentially understand the ecology of dogs in the landscape and trying to understand their risk of getting exposed. And so with that, then we, the second objective is to test whether targeting those specific dogs that might be at higher risk of getting infected. If you, if you target those dogs, does that control rabies just as well as having a 70% vaccination uh, coverage? And so, uh, and the ultimate goal with this uh, idea is to essentially uh, use this information to inform the next Lake Kipia rabies vaccination campaign, so the following years, but also so it's informative for other uh, rabies campaigns in Africa and Asia. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I think one more uh, follow-on uh, question for you, Catherine, is that I, I know you're in the midst of uh, doing some health, trying to do household surveys in the midst of an ongoing pandemic, and I just wanted to if you could share with us how, how that's going, are you, are, you, are you able to do surveys and, and, and how's, how's, how's it been going for you this, these last couple of months since you started? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it has been challenging for sure, uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, typically the way uh, that we go out is we do the surveys um, obviously outside with masks and um, yeah, the household, uh, the owners have been uh, very supportive. Um, because obviously it's mutual, uh, there's mutual benefits. 
Um, but no, we've been able to press on with this project despite everything, which is very fortunate. Okay. And, and, are, and just in general, are you finding that, uh, is there awareness that, um, that rabies is a, a zoonotic disease that can infect people? Or, or do a lot of households not have that level of what they think of it as mad dog disease and not associated with people or wild animals? No, yeah, no, a lot, uh, most owners will definitely uh, realize that there's a risk for people and that it's zoonotic. And I think that's partly because of the like keep your rabies vaccination campaign that started in 2015, because they come every year. And so now a lot of the communities are very much aware that rabies is lethal for people and that their dogs do need to get vaccinated. Okay, thank you. All right, and our, our last panelist, uh, I'll go over to you, Francesca, and um, love to hear a bit about your, your work with uh, Rhino Trans locations in Kenya and some of the, the immense uh, collaboration it takes to, to do that and why you're doing Rhino Trans locations and what, what, what you're studying. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and, and more generally, why it's important to, to when you're doing these to collaborate across uh, different disciplines and sectors to, to affect uh, healthy po rhino population. So with that, yeah. over to you, Francesca. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, so translocation are becoming a more and more common um, intervention management for conservation of species. And for Eastern black rhinos, this is particularly important as Maureen explained very well. Uh, Eastern black rhinos are around 800 left. Uh, so they need intensive management in order to um, survive as a subspecies and in general black rhinos are critically endangered. So I think that many people know the terrible situation that rhinos are facing because of poaching, but in addition to this there is also a fragmented habitat problem, in particular in Kenya. To protect rhinos they are enclosed in a, a rhino sanctuaries that are fenced area and there are 16 in Kenya and in order to promote a genetic exchange and to start new rhino sanctuaries in order to diversify the uh, rhino areas and to have rhino safer in case, for example, of a um, disease outbreak uh, like we are experiencing now with COVID, it's good to have a diversified population. But this uh, involves translocation, which is a very stressful uh, operation. So with my project, I'm uh, studying short and long-term effect of stress uh, during uh, rhino capture and translocation. Indeed, a very important part of the translocation is capture, um, which is uh, anesthesia done in the field in particular uh, situations. So it's very different from a, a veterinary uh, surgery room where there are nurses, uh, monitoring systems. This is made in the field, an helicopter uh, darts the rhinos. So the uh, rhinos, they don't know what a helicopter is, of course. Uh, so there is a whole different situation. So with my project, I will focusing uh, for the first part on the anesthesia. So to try to understand which is their physiological reaction to anesthesia and how to improve the protocols in order to have a safer anesthesia and the monitoring systems. And then doing uh, this in collaboration with the Kenya Wildlife Service uh, veterinarians that uh, have an amazing experience in field capture. So we have developed the research question together and we will be working together. Whereas the second part of the project is focused on uh, stress and endocrinology. So we will be studying uh, saliva and fecal samples uh, during the capture. So when the animals are anesthetized and before and after the capture or translocation in order to understand how they deal with stress. Um, stress can also, um, especially if there is a chronic stress, can increase health problems. For example, it gives immunosuppression, so animals can develop um, diseases like infectious diseases or they are more prone to develop these kind of diseases when they're under stress or can also, uh, they can have a, uh, reduced rate for breeding performances. So um, uh, this is a uh, this building up on Maureen study. She did a very pioneering uh, work, and this is very important. And uh, during this study, we will also try to uh, involve, for example, um, other um, local uh, researchers uh, in order to undertake site projects, for example, on infectious diseases 
and I'm working very closely with a, a rhino scientist expert who, who is going to do the ecological assessment uh, around the translocation. So I think that collaboration is, is a must in these cases, is a very challenging uh, problem and is a very challenging uh, project itself. So I think collaboration is the key and I'm very lucky because I, I have uh, amazing collaborators um, that are also very experienced and uh, Yeah, and, and can you can you give us just a, a little more detail on on basically how 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 does a uh, um, a translocation uh, kind of walk us through a, a translocation besides just a, a mobilizing a, a one of these uh, really large and sometimes aggressive animals and and you know are they typically uh, put on a truck and and transferred a couple hours or is it is it much longer transportation and and how, how are you trying to, to manage uh, stress when, in the individual animal when that happens? Yeah, so it really depends on the uh, situation, but I would say that in most of the cases, an animal is tranquilized. Uh, so once it's anesthetized, it's given uh, some drugs that are called partial antagonists. So they kind of wake up and are able to walk without being uh, totally awake. And then through some ropes, they are guided into uh, crates so when they are in these crates, they are completely revived so they can be awake during the transport, although some tranquilizers are given that keep them quiet, but being able to be awake and be able to react during the road. So, for example, if there are bumps or if the road is rough, they are able to, to stand and to, yeah, to compensate. They are also able to breathe properly. So once they arrive in the new um, release site, which can be sometimes very short distance, sometimes is uh, several hundreds of kilometers. It, it really depends on the conservation uh, projects. They're usually put in bomas, which are um, these enclosures where every rhino is, um, uh, is uh, alone inside this boma. And they usually stay for a month so they can get used to the new environment. Maybe the climate is different and the vegetation is different. And after a month, the, the, the door gets open, usually at night, but it's, when it's very quiet and they, they go out into the new house. Um, in other occasions, there is a uh, no boma. So if, for example, the, the new environment is, is very similar to the original environment, they are just released in the new environment. And in these cases, at the end of the transport, they get immobilized again, um, they get out of the crate, and then they get revived. So they wake up when they are alone because uh, Eastern black rhinos are also very aggressive. Uh, so they don't like to have cars around when they wake up. So you want to make sure they are quiet when they wake up and then they find their, their way into the, the new place. Um, yeah, and uh, the good part of my project and what is very innovative about this project is that we will have the uh, help of uh, rhino rangers to monitor them for months. Uh, so um, for the first time, we will be able to understand how they really deal with stress uh, after months of the release and be able to guide future uh, projects and uh, advise the authority on how to improve these kind of operations. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you to all the panelists. And and um, uh, I, I know we've got about ten minutes left, but I re I really want to give some opportunity for the, the audience to to pose some questions. Uh, so we can do that, that a couple ways. Uh, so if you if you have a question you'd like to to um, uh, put to one of the panelists or all of them, you can use the chat or just uh, you, you can um, use the chat to say please unmute me. <laughs> And, and you can ask uh, verbally or you can you can type it right in the, the uh, chat feature. So I'll, I'll, I'll give folks a, a second to do that. And and um, and while we're doing that, I, I think I just want to pose, uh, you know, a, a question to all the panelists to, to, to address while we're waiting for some questions to come in. But just to, because we're here at the Earth Optimism event on Earth Day. And we've been talking a lot about these these immense challenges and really complex challenges. I'm I'm really curious as to to what keeps you optimistic in, in the face of all these challenges and and what sort of inspires you to to do the the awesome work you guys you, all of you are doing. So I'll I'll open that up and and please folks uh, folks that are in the audience please um, add in some questions either for specific panelists or for the whole group. So 
Well, I'll kick off there. Um, you know, I, I think there's a great sense for optimism because we could actually solve these problems. You know, we have the technology developing. We just need the willpower from everyone. And we do forget that people do win. So we know the story of the wolves put into Yellowstone that caused that trophic cascade and really revitalized the ecosystem. And Mac, uh, you and I, of course, have a fondness for New Zealand. And, you know, many years of work have resulted in native birds coming back and you now see them in, in suburbs and cities. So it does happen and perhaps often the media focuses on the negative and we forget that good things are happening out there. Okay, anybody else care to, to respond to that too? Okay, we do we do have a, uh, a question in the chat. Um, and I'll, I'll just I'll just read it out loud and, and I'll take a first crack at it and then and then hand it off to folks. So so Deborah's asked, uh, um, do we do we feel the, the general public has an understanding of, of global health programs? And, and what do we wish uh, the public knew about our projects specifically? Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll take a first shot at this uh, real shortly, but one of the big missions, of course, for the, for the National Zoo is to, to really connect um, the, the educational aspect. And when people come, come to the zoo and see some of these um, endangered species and, and wildlife species in a, in a zoo environment, we really want to educate the educate folks there about the, the actual situation of that, that species in, in their home um, habitat and environment. And that, that's really what I, I think is critical uh, and gets me excited is just um, helping, helping uh, folks that aren't able to travel around the world see that, that you know, there, there are these immense challenges uh, on, on wild animal populations around the world. And it, and it gets me pretty excited to, to um, have, have sessions like this and try to connect, connect people with, with some of the awesome work we're undertaking. So it, it's an ongoing, ongoing effort to, to um, get the messages out about the, the global health and, and why, why the interconnection of wild animals, domestic animals, humans in our shared environments are, are critical to understand. Any other panelists wanna take a... Um, Stab at that too. What What do you wish the uh, general public knew about the the projects you're working on? Yeah, I think uh, I'll take a shot. Um, yeah, I think I would definitely. Uh, I'm uh, I'm hoping that, um, especially with everything happening at the moment, that there's more understanding that everything is connected. Obviously, both globally, but also across um, species. So human, domestic animals and wildlife. Um, just because I think a lot of these diseases, even though um, the public will know that there's their multi-species pathogens, for example, oftentimes people will think of them in like little boxes, like human side, domestic animal side. And I think it's really important uh, that there's more emphasis on uh, highlighting that everything is connected. And I'll call on you, Sashi Kala, because I can see you uh, formulating a response there. <laughs> what, what do you wish that uh, that people in Sri Lanka or just around the world knew about the, the work you're doing? Yeah, the uh, I think the because the most of the most of the public they don't even know what are the uh, threats that the conservation and the wild animals or the other animals that have. So it's even the talking about uh, the threats and uh, the, the problems, challenges that they have, that, that's also an important and how uh, it is important to know the things that how they are approaching, how the, the conservation is approaching, how those things are happening around the world. So, what can we, uh, what can we do for, uh, for conservation? So, to understand those things, it's it's good to have. 
this kind of. Okay. And, and another question in the chat coming from, from Meredith. Uh, she's asking, how do you think that COVID has or will influence the public's view of wildlife health and zoonotic diseases? So Maureen, I know you've, you've thought a lot about uh, COVID in Kenya, so I'll, I'll call on you to try to address that one. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, so I think, I think the COVID situation will have, I hope it will have a positive impact on, you know, the world's view of wildlife in that um, my hope is we won't view wildlife as just the source of disease, but more evaluate our interaction with wildlife and um, the habitats they occupy and really question ourselves, um, what are we doing to, you know, build a healthier planet, not just for us as human beings, but for wildlife as well, recognizing that the health of wildlife has um, major effects on we human beings as well. And really, I hope it doesn't just come from that selfish perspective of, you know, how does, you know, wildlife health impact me, but, you know, recognizing that really wildlife are part of our uh, natural ecosystem and, I think the understanding that to that this the challenges that we are seeing in our real world today are major feedback from nature and really a call to action for us uh, to do more to build better regardless of how small that is you know if that means buying less going vegetarian using coral reef safe sunscreen, whatever it is, I think each one of us can contribute to um, the health of our planet. And, um, you know, I don't think one man can change the world, but then all of us contributing in whatever small way we can, um, will have a cumulative effect on planetary health. So yeah, that's, that's my thought. Okay. And we have just about a, a minute or two left. Um, so I'll, I'll op open that same question up to the, to the rest of the panelists just for another response. <laughs> and thank you, Maureen, that was a really good one. Um, so anybody else care to respond? Do you, do you think that, do you agree that this is a, a, a bit of a mother nature wake up call and hopefully, hopefully people will be more aware of the interconnection, the One Health connection? I'm happy to add something. Uh, I completely agree with Maureen, and I think it's a very important occasion for scientists to start to communicate. I think it's a very important part of our job and our uh, social responsibility to be able to communicate science in order to involve the public. And I think an event like this is a very good occasion to, uh, to involve the public and make them understand um, that they're very important, uh, that their support is very important for conservation and towards achieving a healthier uh, planet uh, with their daily actions. Uh, so this is my opinion. And yeah, I think we should really make a bigger effort as younger scientists to involve younger uh, generations. Uh, and the good part is that younger generations care. So I think there is a very big hope. Great, excellent response. Thank you, Francesca. And, and with that, I, I'd just like to say a, a few words of thanks again to, to, to the uh, fo um, folks that helped us uh, put this on today. So the Earth Optimism event is through the, the Smithsonian Conservation Commons. And we've had a, a few folks, Meredith and, and um, uh, Christina working in the, in the background to, to run our Zoom. So thank you to them. And I do want to I do want to uh, thank again um, Janet and Morris Animal Foundation for for really supporting our our, our training programs and, and partnering with us to to make some some positive difference in the in the face of these these global grand challenges. Um, we really appreciate all the effort and, and support and the the joint um, joint partnership uh, that it, that it takes to address some of these complex challenges. So thanks everyone for joining and it's really great to see all of you panelists today. I really appreciate your time and waking up early or staying up late um, wherever you're zooming in from today.
So thank you very much and, and have a great rest of your Earth Day. Thank you. Great to meet everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah.